Hey, sports fans, welcome to Greg Medford's show. Greg, your host here in Phoenix, Arizona. You know, uh, we've talked a lot of politics this cycle, this uh, midterm election cycle, and the primaries leading up to where we're at now. Um, I have a lot of issues that everybody's talked about, and I see two paradigms going on in the political landscape. We're going to talk about some of those today. So whether you're from Davenport, Iowa, or Des Moines, Iowa, or you're from Marin County or Brookline, Massachusetts, Bronx, New York, Miami, Florida. These are all relevant and they're all pressing on all of us. There's two things that I think are going on. We do see some weird, strange, you know, it's when you hear people say, oh, that's a conspiracy theory. That is a lazy way of saying, oh, I don't want to have to talk about that. It's too big for me to defend or say that it's not true. And it turns out a lot of conspiracy theories are, are actually coming true more and more uh, over the last maybe five or six years. One of the things I see happening is this, there is a globalist cabal that is crushing capitalism. It is Marxism by another shade, and it's an assault on a way of collectively empowering humans to raise their plight better than any thing has ever done in all of recorded and pre-recorded human history no society has ever elevated more people around the globe in greater numbers than capitalism and what we see is a globalist cabal under the guise of green under the guise of social justice under the guise of these theoretical terms that in fact most of us don't even believe in when defined and they club us over the head for as being white supremacists or racists or bigots or whatever if we're not willing to just, on face value, accept their crazy terms and definitions. And so the erosion has already happened. In my opinion, Washington is a big stink hole of awfulness. And what it'll do is it'll run out our elected official. Our top guy, if we send him there, they'll run him out. It's such a rotten, awful place. I think it may be the worst place on planet Earth with good wine and good booze and good food. I think it's maybe the worst place on Earth. Full of maybe many of the worst people. Most jaded, awful people to destroy their own country we've, that's ever existed. And we have one chance to stop it, and it's at the state level. It really is, because every state can still stiff-arm the federal government. Because they don't quite yet have the chutzpah to show up here with troops. But mark my words, in 20 years you will see federal troops deployed against all law and constitutionality here in the United States against citizens who don't want and citizens who will buck this globalist green cabal of lunatics who in their blind efforts to save something theoretically they know nothing about as a bunch of goddamn liberal arts majors meddling in science so they can't even pick a tornado that's going to happen but they've got figured out what's going to happen in 100 years these nut jobs are going to thrust 2 billion of the world's population into abject poverty and, and starvation worse than it already is with their broad strokes on electric cars that have to get powered by something their broad strokes on a green agenda that they haven't you know if 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 you want to have a steak, they'll tell you every bit of carbon that's used all the way back to the baby's cow when the baby was born. They want to tell you every bit of the global impact of eating that piece of meat. But if you buy a battery-powered car with the batteries made in China using molybdenum and, and nickel and all of these precious metals pulled out of the earth, all of the energy, all of the coal-fired power plants that were used to make those batteries, the life cycle of that battery, the disposal of that battery, the impact on the environment. If you have that discussion with them, they only want to talk about when you buy it from Elon. They don't want to talk about anything before the moment it was an electric car. They have cognitive dissonance. So if you want to have a steak, we're going to crawl up the, 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 the cow, the, the, the calf's mom's ass and count their farts. But it if you, you, they don't want you to have an internal combustion engine, they want to have an electric car, they're only going to count for the minute it rolls off the showroom floor. 
And if you ask it, where's the electricity come from? You know, it's nuclear. Can we get some more nuclear power plants? Oh, no, no, we're shutting those down. You know, they're shutting down nuclear power plants in California having rolling brownouts. That's this, the, the cornerstone of a modern country is the power's always on. So we're going to talk about some of those issues at the state level today. I've got two candidates with me today, Nancy Barto and Maria Sims. They're both running for re-election here in Arizona. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about stuff that's on their plate. We're going to talk about stuff that's on my plate. We're going to spitball a little bit. And uh, as we as we get into the final leg of this midterm cycle, talk about how important it is, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. It's really important that you don't hold on to your old allegiances in the changing tides of the parties. If you're a lifelong Democrat, you know, my family was Democrats. They really were. And I made the change. And when I made the change, my dad switched over because he asked me and we started talking about it. And I said, dad, they don't stand for that. Dad, they want to change our way of life. Dad, they don't believe in capitalism. Oh yeah, we do believe in capitalism. No, they don't. And they don't believe in empiricism. You know, my dad and I are science guys. If you believe in science and you believe in the scientific method of experimentation, hypotheses, observational outcome, and conclusion, if how could you be a liberal? Because everything they do flies in the face of observable, empirical, empiricism, and science, and fact. It's bananas. So, that's the conversation we have today. Ladies, welcome to the show. Thank you. Awesome to be here. Thanks, Greg. So, we've run into each other a bunch of times over the last three months or so uh, at fundraisers and political events. Give me your take on this cycle compared to previous cycles. You've done one cycle before. This is your first time being reelected, right? So, so our second time being reelected. Yeah, I served in the state house um, for the old district before redistricting. And then the Democrats swept in in our district. And uh, I've been out of office for the last four years. And now I'm getting back in the game. Because were you, I think it's were really you in important. for four, though? Two years. You were in for two. So you yes. were in one term before. One term. Mm -hmm. And then with the redistricting, you've run an LD4. Now I'm running an LD4 in the new okay. district. Okay. Yes. All right. All right. <laughs> and, um, and there are two spots that are open right now. Is that right? Yes, there are two House seats. And uh, so there's two Republican nominees for two spots. And the Democrats have put up one nominee for uh, to try, they call it single shot, to try to get one of the seats, knock one of us out. All right. So it's you and Matt Gress, right? Correct. Okay. And then who, and who's the person you're running against? A woman who is the legislative liaison in Arizona for National Organization for Women. Her name is Laura Tarek. So n Laura from now, what national organization women yeah laura from now yeah yeah okay um and is she a long a long time arizona girl or i mean is she just a lunatic friend who showed up here and is going to take over the country with california money what's well i all i know is she's not a long-term ld4 person okay uh, she i think she lived out of the district uh she says she's a former teacher but she doesn't you know she's not teaching anymore um but uh, her her big thing is defund the police uh, late term, I call her late term Laura, late term abortions, um, right up until an after birth. Uh, that, that's why she's running. Uh, she wants less uh, police and she wants to um, uh, have woke schools, former teacher. Uh, and she wants to have parents have no say in the course of what their children are going to be uh, in this great country. She, big it's government. It's bananas that the conversation is so often gotten to this insanity about late-term abortion which almost nobody agrees with in this country even people who identify as feminist which is a very small minority of women when polled nationally very small minority uh identify as feminist it's a it's a movement founded by angry lesbians in the 1960s that has wholly failed because 85% of American women don't identify as feminist. That tells me it's a movement that failed, right? And, and, and so after a half century of madness, um, we dominate the discussion with late-term abortion attached to feminism. 
Well, you were talking about contradictions, how contradictory the left is, right? Yeah. So I, I, let's start right at the top with National Organization for Women. How do you continue with an organization that can't even define what a woman is right. with the in the title? Right. It's, it's the height of hypocrisy. And they, they do not um, care about the rights of women. They have a political agenda that they're putting on everybody, whether they like it or not. And it's extreme. It's extreme. Everybody heard what was going on in Virginia when they were talking about having abortions after birth, that you should decide that after the baby's born alive and have a conversation with your doctor. That's ridiculous. It's absurd. No one agrees with that. It's funny when you have this conversation with like folks who aren't in this circle running around doing fundraisers and doing politics and, you know, getting the grease that makes the political wheel turn. They, they think you're making this stuff up. You're like, no, 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 this actually happened. You, you can Google this and watch it. You know, the, the, this conversation about post-birth abortion. Is that in Florida that that discussion happened in, in the Senate there? I can't remember, Nancy, maybe. No, I thought it was Virginia. I'm not sure. I heard, the, I I heard the one in Virginia and I was... That's what they stand for from the beginning. Uh, you know, they don't really don't like to talk about the roots of where abortion comes from. Right. But it uh, it springs from Margaret Sanger and the racism, uh, reducing the population of minorities, blacks in particular. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it all hangs together with being able to control who lives and who dies. And that begins from before birth, after birth, all the way to... Uh, deciding who's fit to live, the disabled, the elderly, and at what point. Right. Um, you know, you asked originally what has really changed since uh, since we've served and now we're running again. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been amazed at, I've served since 2006, unbelievably. And you used to be able to have some conversations that made some sense in terms of this issue. Not anymore. Not anymore. Every Democrat that runs for office, I think probably in every state now, but certainly in Arizona, is a radical Democrat. And there's no compromising that makes sense. They, uh, they stand for radical things. And there's, we have to win these, these battles in, yeah. in this general election uh, to save, I think, the lives of citizens. I had a discussion with my 16-year-old daughter. I think one of the best things that's happened, and in, in certainly in 52 years that I know of, the Roe v. Wade decision pulled the rug out from the American democracy. And people don't realize how it permeated and infected every corner of the republic. It basically allowed unelected, permanently appointed people to begin to make the decisions of big things in our lives, like the EPA. It, you know, way beyond abortion. And uh, pulling that back, you know, I said at a big gathering, the Republicans are about 400 people. And I said, hey, don't pat yourself on the back over the abortion thing. This was a win for the Constitution because they shouldn't be making these decisions about anything in our lives. Only our elected officials can do that. And if they can't do that, good. They're, they're, par they're paralyzed. Fantastic. They can't do anything. Awesome. I can get back, back about my life. But one of the things that's happened, I think it's the great American, it's the great American experience. The ball has now been tossed back into 50 courts for everyone to battle it out. And I mean the court of public opinion, and I don't mean legal courts. It's been tossed back to us, and there's all these fights going on around the country. And we're going to see some radical, we're going to see some surprise conservative and we're going to see a whole lot of moderate everywhere. I think it's going to happen. We saw it in Kansas. The ruling that went down in Kansas shocked everybody because it's a Bible Belt conservative place. And it made a very, very, very kind of middle of the road compromise and solution. So I'm curious to hear, like, that could be coming up in this legislative session here. Because uh, Brnovich has, you know, cited this 1907, I think, territorial zero abortion, zero anything, which a lot of people applaud. Only problem is 8% of Arizonans agree with that. The other 92% don't agree with that. And, and you know, since it's a democracy of some sorts, there's going to be some compromise. What do you think? Where do you think it's going to end up? Because you're going to be voting on this probably maybe this session. 
Absolutely. And that's, you know, that's the thing that they really don't want to discuss is that, you know, shooting down Roe v. Wade had to happen. It had to happen in order to save our Constitution. And it's going to have to happen on other issues, too, uh, where there's been such federal overreach by the courts. I think Clarence Thomas pointed that out and Justice Thomas pointed it out and everybody, you know, all of a sudden they want to they want to they want to hang him. The big unsaid is that Roe v. Wade allowed um, every state to have abortion um, passed well, up to the ninth month. Right. That's the great unsaid. And so yeah. when people say that we we approve of, of Roe v. Wade, that's what they're saying. Yeah. I don't think most Americans and most Arizonans understand what they're saying when they're asked that question. Yeah. And so, you know, it is up to the states to decide what those limits will be. Um, I, personally, I believe that life begins at conception and it should be protected at conception. Um, that is not where the American people are right now. That's no. not where most Arizonans are. Yeah. I think they're, they are going to demand some, some <coughs> exceptions. Um, and we're going to have to hash those out because, you know, it's for 50 years, we've been sold a bill of goods that women need abortion in order to, you be name healthy. it. Yes, right. be, be healthy, woman. succeed in life, uh, pre- prevent um, children being abused. All of those issues have been debunked over yeah, and total over bullshit. again. Yeah, total bullshit. Abortion is horrible for women's health. Yeah. Every type of abortion and the, the abortion pill in particular, and now they're selling it through the mail. And, you know, putting women at women's health at risk tremendously by doing that, by not being cognizant of, of at what at what stage they're, they're they're shooting this woman this pill and telling telling her to take it and have that baby in a toilet on her own alone it's incredible um, but we will be having these conversations mm. at the state level now and um, you know I welcome that I, but I do think it's a great opportunity uh, for uh, for for us to uncover what the the far left what the democratic party has been standing for and that is not not reason on this issue it's 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 irrational uh type of uh overreach that allows the really where it's leading it's already led to and we've got to start pulling that back it's emotional baiting they've emotionally baited everybody what i was going to say is what's interesting about this is i've got a 16 year old daughter Mm. And she's in public school because I believe in public schools and I work hard to push and have the meetings with everybody and push and push. And they know like, oh my God, Mr. Medford's called me up. What's happened now? Mm-hmm. But it it's created, we had this discussion. I'm going to tell you this discussion. I'm sure you've had this. And this is the discussion I want anybody who watches this, if there's a woman who watches this, to think about. And it's something for Democrats to think about when we talk to cent- center of the aisle or even slightly left of center voters or people who identify feminist. I talked to my daughter and, and she, you know, kind of identifies as borderline feminist. Because how do you not, as you're 16 and you're coming into your womanhood and you're meeting these female teachers and they're giving you this information, she's trying to find her power and I'm really comfortable with that. And we started talking about the abortion thing and she says, oh, you know, she kind of rolled her eyes at me because she figures I'm this crazy anti-abortion you know pro-life you know staunch easy to categorize guy and she is this pro-woman pro-choice don't tell me what to do with my body mentality and i started asking her questions i said okay so i said so how do you feel about like in the eighth month of life a baby that's Four weeks before being born, they go in, chop its head off, cut its arms off, and rip it out with a suction cup, tear it off, break it into bits to get it out. What do you you think? She looked at me, and she goes, uh, no, no, I'm I'm not good with that. I go, okay. So I go, you know, there's there's a couple of lines here. The moment of conception, which is going to be your kind of Christian perspective. There's going to be the heartbeat, which is going to be your kind of science-y people. There's going to be your viability, the moment a baby could live and that number has changed over the years as we've gotten better. So there's kind of three lines here. I go, so what about all the way back to, I don't know, whatever the whatever the week is now, the week a baby is viable. I think it's the 23rd week, they say now or something like that. 
Okay. Okay. So at at the 21 Mm -hmm. week mark, how about then? She's like, oh no. I said, okay. I go, well, just so you know, you've just become a radical pro-life anti-woman person. (laughs) And she kind of looked at me. I said, how do you feel about, just looked at some pictures, like 15th week. She said, no. How about the heartbeat? She's like, well, I'm not really comfortable after the heartbeat, but up to then I'm okay with that. I said, okay, so that's maybe the seventh week or something somewhere around there. And uh, most people don't even know they're pregnant until several weeks after that. I, and she says, yeah, but I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with that. I go, okay. I go, you're a radical. And she says, well, I go, look, I'm just asking the questions because nobody ever actually breaks it down for you. The real choice. When you start really breaking it down, I said, good for you. You're a woman. You're the keeper of life. And Thank God your parents raised you right. You don't believe in the slaughter of children. I, I said, you're a radical now. I go, that's not radical. I said, that's reasonable. I go, you seem really reasonable to me. And you know what? I said, you and I are so close. It isn't crazy, radical, conservative dad and liberal daughter. We're almost identical. And I've had this conversation so many times now with other women in my life because people say, well, what do the women in your life think? I'm like, I don't know. Let me ask him. So, so I've been asking. But the conversation has changed from, you know, my body, my choice to actually talking about abortion. And I think that's where we can get some public policy that serves people. I agree. You know, uh, the conversation can't even happen on the left. They, they shut it down. You can't ask those questions. Because you're against women. That's right. You're totally against women's health care unless you agree to their radical idea that you should be able to abort it's your body you should be able to abort a baby up until birth that is no one agrees with that bananas it is and it shows you that the left the radical left even though they want to say republicans are extreme you've seen the attack ads now on carrie lake and blake masters and they're running with this abortion issue that they're being extreme that's not the case that what you described is where they're at the the other side is the the radical uh extreme uh view but to abort a baby when that could be, be born and uh it shows you that the left is embracing a culture that does not value life in all aspects of our society so if you want to be endorsed by planned parenthood for example you have to agree with defunding the police well what does that do nancy touched on earlier how the history of planned parenthood it it hurts our most vulnerable or at risk populations that the left claims to protect right and then they want to defund the police which was the results of that what have what have been the results of that i mean yeah it's we're, more we're injurious yeah. violent assaults yeah. on uh the african-american community and and many many others and uh it just shows you how radical they are that they they don't value life they just value big government telling you what to do, everybody get in line. And what you were talking about earlier, Greg, with the Marxism and socialism, tell me one place where Marxism and socialism and big government telling you what to do has succeeded in the world. Nowhere, Nowhere. right? Epic failure, China, North Korea, uh, Venezuela, all Russia, failure after failure, starvation, pain, death. Yeah. And, Absolutely. and this is what the left is embracing? Yeah, it's, it's crazy. It is crazy. And and I want the voters to understand that we are at risk. You asked what was different about this election. Everybody always says, oh, this the mistakes couldn't be higher. But my goodness, I mean, I've been watching this thing. This is why I've decided to get back in the arena. Uh, I rang the bell on the socialism efforts in Arizona four years ago when I was in the House, and I was shut down by the media, by the left, even by some Republicans. Uh, they couldn't they couldn't believe that that would be possible in our great nation. Well, I think we've seen it come to pass. Yeah. And and it we are at risk. You know, the the uh, the, the press are um, derelict in their duty and I, I don't know how to hold a free press accountable. I don't know what we do other than stop listening to them. Carrie said something really interesting at the Trump rally a few weeks back. She said she got numbers from some of her friends behind in the business, actual, not market share, actually how many people were watching the major news networks on a Friday night in Phoenix. Did you hear when she said this? Yes. And it was like 2,000. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's, 
I don't know, 4 million people in Metro Phoenix, right? Yeah. Said 2,000. The truth is, the legacy media has become irrelevant on their own watch and of their own accord. If they just spoke the truth and played it down the middle, played, you know, played neutral, people would actually watch because it's more engaging. But it's turned into entertainment. And we're stuck talking about the truth in these little venues like this. Their only choice now is to shut down free speech like what you're doing today. Yeah. Um, and they shut me down all the time. That's where that that's what people are listening to now. Yeah. They are seeking and they're finding the truth because yeah. people are speaking up themselves. And that that too is 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 the huge difference from what i've seen over the years in serving and for running you used to run on issues like i'm going to cut this tax and cut that tax and you know so that we can bring prosperity um uh, one issue at a time now it's like we're talking philosophy because people know the times demand that they're standing up like never before because they are personally their freedoms are being shut down. We saw it, you know, through the shutdown itself, just brought this all to the the surface in in a way that I think nothing else could have. And uh, the the silver lining here is people have gotten off the sidelines, and now even though they might not be able to connect all of the dots, they are engaged, and we've got to speak to and and identify what their fear is and what those solutions are and the solution is pretty simple it's getting back to the values of american freedom and the constitution and following all of those policies that support that individual rights yeah what are your um are are, are the uh man i am hearing a crazy amount of noise about national digital currency um, the devaluation of the dollar, the intentional collapse of our financial system to kind of switch us over to a digital currency. I know the Canadians are talking about it. China's talking about it. There's been some big war game studies on um, countries linking their digital currency to the gold standard and collapsing the American dollar. You know, they can't win the military hardware war, but they can collapse our dollar around the world, which is the war. Um, you know, the dollar gives us freedom, the actual paper dollar, your ability to spend as you choose and it's nobody's business. It, it, it may be the most fundamental thing of our country and it's lasted 250 years. I guess my curiosity is that on y'all's horizon, is that something we can do anything about here in Arizona? Have you heard anything about it? Cause it's the big chatter in the intelligentsia right now. In, in in the Washington I mean I had dinner with Washington people this past week and I, I was literally spooked about what they were talking about casually as it's coming out now it's in the works everybody's talking about it around town in Washington um, it's gonna take a lot of state level courage to stand up against things like this um, people with big visions in order to to really represent the the people's individual liberties here in the states, like you alluded to at the beginning, um, I you know I, I hear a lot of things um, that I hadn't heard specifically, but I you know except in broader terms, mm -hmm. um, but you see it on every uh, in every sphere, uh, from energy to healthcare. Um, people have lost trust in public health and demanding that government get its thumb off the scale and allow them to really choose the type of health care they want. You're seeing it in education, obviously, um, where people are completely lost, lost faith in the public system, although, uh, you know, obviously we need it, uh, but they're demanding some accountability here. For, for the millions we spend, billions we spend. Yeah. Um, you're seeing it in, in, in everywhere. Um, so yes, yes, it's uh, we, we've got to, I remember my dad, you know, he used to own a gold coin uh, business in the 70s and he, he would lament us going off the gold currency, the gold standard. Yeah. And, uh, and how that devalued our power as a United States. 
Um, Because it tied us to a real thing. It tied us to a real, real thing. You you know, you're seeing people try and uh, and think about how they would live off the grid. You know, how they would uh, how they would survive. We've got to get back to the point where uh, government allows that type of liberty to flourish in case things like this happen. Um, Because, you know, just what I've seen over the last few years, personally, I've served in the Health and Human Services Committee. And a big part of what we do as legislators, you know this, uh, Maria, in your time, is uh, is we oversee all of the agencies and all the spending and what they do and how they carry out the policies that we as legislators pass. And there's so much, so much swampiness in in the Arizona agencies. Yeah. You know, you talk a lot about DC and the power brokers there. They're they're just as active. The bureaucracies are just as off the radar, just doing their own thing because, you know, they're weebies. We'd be here before you got here. We'd be here after you leave, they tell it, the legislature or the governor. And so, you know, it's up to us to recognize. That's the benefit of, I think, being there a while as a legislator, maybe coming back when you see things and saying, hey, there's a lot more to do here once I got my eyes open here, you know, into what's happening at the state level. States are where it's at. Talk to me a little bit about, do you have a, a legislative agenda, top, you know, low-hanging fruit, top few items that are kind of foremost in your mind as you step into the next session? There's a there's a ton of them. Um, I'll, let, I'll let Maria lead on the border, but I'm certainly there with her. The border is, uh, is, is very huge on, on, what, on what we can do, um, but I'm going to focus mostly on the health and human services aspects because I think that that's kind of where my, um, my forte has been as chairman for, for many years, um, is really getting a, whole, a handle on those agencies and uh, demanding independent accountability and uh, protecting the rights of the individual um, and the vulnerable. You know, we spend um, a ton of money, both federal and state dollars every year, um, to care for people on access, who the disabled, the mentally ill, those incarcerated. And there's so little individ, ind, independent oversight and accountability for how those monies are spent. And you know who pays the biggest price is the most vulnerable, the right. most sick, and the most seriously mentally ill who end up homeless. And then we end up re-spending money that we shouldn't in the first place. Um, and so the, that's... You know, that's kind of a, a a topic that demands a little bit of time like we have here today to talk about. Um, and it doesn't fit easily into a, a palm card that you'd send to your, your base. Yeah. Um, but frankly, I think people, uh, families that I've been hearing from over the years on these issues have brought it to light. And I'm listening to them rather than the agencies. You know, I've got, um, I have a friend who's on uh, access and has some kind of uh, state insurance and she got cancer on her nose and had to have the whole front of her nose removed. And she's been almost two years trying to get the reconstruction on her nose done and she can't afford it. And it happened while she was down and she's still kind of in a jam. And I see, (laughs) I see that going on. It affects the folks who can't take who are the most vulnerable, uh, all of these shortcomings. And there's a lot of money being wasted constantly. Yeah, we have too many in the basket to be cared for. And they, because we have a managed care system, they focus on those that are less sick. Let's get them their their uh, their preventive medications, their preventive vaccines, and their, uh, get them to, uh, you know, their GPs and all. Um, but those that are very sick, you, they're on the back burner because mm-hmm. they cost too much money. You need yeah. to get them, focus on those that need that care and then move them off to self-sufficiency so they're no longer dependent. That's that's my philosophy. I think that's the philosophy of our party. Uh, Maria, how about you? Low-hanging fruit stuff that you want to jump into on the legislative yeah, end. So uh, Nancy mentioned it. Obviously, border security is top of mind of everyone, I think, regardless of party right now, we've seen the negative effects in our own communities. Anyone that thinks that 
um, border security doesn't affect you in our district in Scottsdale, Paradise Valley, Phoenix, uh, they're just grossly misinformed or they have their head in the sand and or don't want you to know the truth. Um, we see it every day, well, let the me, apprehensions let, at the border of the drugs that are coming through. And so we have an eight point plan. That oh, we're, we're okay. Oh, that's what I want to hear yeah. about. Because, yeah. you know, there's really for the folks who you can sway, the folks who are conservatives, like my lunatic fringe knife and gun folks, they're, they're, they're already voting conservative. Right, right. So we're really talking to mm, about 7% in the middle who can kind of sw swap or maybe an open minded lefty who's a little freaked out by the greeny agenda. So I guess Mike, yeah, you, so there, I, I, there's two there's two conversations though. The one is do walls work, <laughs> all right? Because that's that's a big overall question. Because everybody who talks about this problem ends up getting back to finish the wall. That ends up being the last phrase of their whatever their litany of things that they want to do are. Is is finish the wall part of your eight point plan? Well, I think absolutely we have to have border security and we need to continue to fund what we can do as a state to secure the border. That means supporting our border sheriffs for their apprehensions and things like that. Now, many politicians just say they're going to secure the border and they point the finger at the federal government. And I mean, our own governor right now said he was going to secure the border. And now we're playing Legos at the border in the last months of his, of his term. And it's still not a, not a problem that we've gotten a handle on, but I do believe that there is low hanging fruit, as you said, um, for border security, there are certain things that we can do that are part of our plan, like the state can eliminate any contracts with any entity that transports illegal immigrants um, into our state or, or elsewhere for resettlement. Um, we can also hold China accountable, believe it or not. Um, we see the fentanyls coming through. The drug cartels are getting it from China, the precursor sure. drugs. Um, and so we shouldn't be doing business with any uh, drug manufacturer from China as a state. There are things that we can do that that do have an impact and also have an impact symbolically to say we're not going to take it anymore. And until the federal government uh, steps up to the plate and does their duty, we're going to fill that void and we're going to lead on this issue and show other states how it's done. Um, and so there are things that we can do at the state level that as long as we have the courage to do it. Um, and I think that there's a lot of people who are going into the legislature we expect that are going to have that courage and are going to say we're not going to kick it down the road anymore. So um, that's a priority. And then the other thing is we talk about, you know, the left wants to talk about education. They always want to talk about the teachers unions and... and uh, we need more to, money for the children. Yes, more money for the children. Well, that doesn't get you anywhere if you don't have safe communities. And I'll tell you, Greg, and I'm sure you've heard these stories. You get a, you get a call from a friend of a friend who says their kid, high school kid at Brophy, took a Xanax, went to bed, didn't wake up because it was laced with fentanyl. And it was just in the news this week. I think they apprehended it in Yuma. The rainbow pills now that they're trying they're trying to get our kids. They're trying to kill our kids. We talk about valuing life. These drug cartels don't care. Um, and uh, so. I think that we need to have a, a really strong, robust police force to stop this um, because the border's not secure. It's coming in anyway. And we have a thousand officer shortfall in Phoenix and we have um, probably a couple hundred shortfall in Scottsdale in our district alone. And we, I, I will propose a an initiative called Refund the Police and we will give incentives to anyone who wants to join the police force. Uh, even if they're coming from out of state where they're not valued, I'd like to make Arizona a leader as a law enforcement friendly state. Hmm. Okay. Refund the police. One of the scariest things I, uh, I foresee, unfortunately, you know, uh, but for the grace of God and, and I pray uh, a lot, a lot on these things, uh, is, is, is how dangerous, uh, and at risk our kids are can be and in, in so-called gun-free zones um in particular um i'd love i'd love to see and pr and uh, really incentivize schools to harden their schools um but there are there are people that have uh and, and we've gone through some of these demonstrations of how schools can be uh, really uh, protect themselves from uh rogue attacks 
um, short of, of just arming every teacher. Um, but I do, I do believe we have to push on that and give teachers and staff in these places the opportunity to protect themselves and the children that they are um, that they are responsible for. We, yeah. about that. we started that conversation, Nancy, four years ago. Yeah. I was on the committee down in the legislature to, to how do we fortify our schools? What can we do? Uh, and But the conversation never got anywhere because the Democrats automatically jump to Second Amendment and background checks. And so it's a complete non-starter, especially when you don't have a strong majority to be able to get these right. things through. And, and Lord, luckily, hopefully we will have one, Yeah. Um, which is so, it, we need everyone out there to vote. We need everyone out there to vote who cares about really protecting our kids, protecting our citizenry. The Second Amendment is not just an, uh, something that we hold up and say we believe. We've got to have policy that supports citizens' rights and liberties in order to really protect themselves. Um, because we are in an era where people over the last, you know, decades, they don't value life. They, it's, it's more of an attention grabbing thing. Uh, we've got people with mental illness that are running rogue, that we're not controlling. Um, and so, you know, who's the most vulnerable? Those, those gun free zones, those public buildings, those public parks where you have those signs, and signs just don't protect you anymore. So we fought for school resources, school resource mm -hmm. officers, for example, and we had opposition on that. You know, normally people are it's a no brainer. Why wouldn't you want a school resource officer to protect your kids? Well, I'll tell you, one of the most vocal opponents of it was a Democrat. When I served in the House, he's now indicted because he's a sex, alleged to be a sexual predator. He's facing criminal trial. Who is this? Who are we talking about? Um, Tony Navarrete. Re Representative Tony. Navarrete. Okay. Yeah. And so you, you ask yourself, why wouldn't somebody want a school resource officer? Why wouldn't somebody vote for Senator Bartow's bill to have curriculum transparency so we know what's going on in our children's classrooms? What are they hiding? Yeah, that's the real question. When you don't want any investigation into an election, when you don't want any investigation into curriculum, when you don't want transparency, I there's always some skullduggery going it's on. It's always nothing to see here. Move on, right? Everything, every article you read in the media is debunked this and debunked that. Who debunked it? I didn't see the evidence. Did you? How, how do we secure <laughs> the schools without them becoming prisons? Um. Well, you know, because I don't like what's happened in the last 10 years as I've watched in my children's schools put up the bulletproof glass and you can't get in, you can't meet anybody, you can't go in the classrooms. Well, and this madness, this leftism hides behind this. They lock the doors and then there's none of us around. And then the next thing you know, they're telling your seven year old little boy that, you know, he could be a trans. Mm hmm. And that's what's really happening. People think it's like home, homophobic fear. It's not. I actually know people in my life this is happening with. My question is, how do we not lock the schools down and still have this? Well, because I, think, I think Nancy's bill for curriculum transparency is a really, really good start so that parents parents aren't going to sit down and be quiet anymore. You've, seen, you've heard it. You're a parent. You're very involved, Greg. You want answers, and I think the pandemic pulled the curtain back on what's happening, and parents are more awake than ever. They're not woke. They're awake. The other thing is having mama bears walking around school all the time. Not just, you know, people think they can do stuff at these meetings, and it has a very diminishing capacity for change or monitoring compared to 26 moms a day wandering the halls of a school nudging everyone. I like the mama bears everywhere. And I like them saying, oh, I don't like her. She says crazy stuff to the kids. Well, that gets around to all the moms, and the principal says, no, nah, I don't think you're going to come back next year. I mean, that's there's real power in the mama bears being there. Absolutely. They've got everybody locked out. And they're running for school boards, and we got to support them. Yeah. And, they're in mass running and, for school and, boards And that's now. fantastic, but they've locked up the, the asylum, and no one's allowed in anymore. And remember uh, how they used to welcome uh, pa parents into the yes. house because they needed that help. Of course, now they pay aides and things like that and, you know, uh, complain that they can't get enough staff. Well, invite the parents back. Let them see. Uh, it, it became pretty clear during the, the shutdown and all the Zooming of, of classroom instruction what was actually going on. And 
they really like that that uh, aspect of the shutdown. I think a Parental Rights Act could be one of the most powerful things the next group of legislators could do. Not only is it pretty forward in everyone's political consciousness right now after what happened with Youngkin's win in Virginia, um, after uh, the FBI, you know, basically classifying, you know, angry parents as terrorists. I think some sort of parental rights act would be really, really valuable. Like parents have a, you know, almost a no questions asked if, if you're not carrying a firearm and you're willing to sign in and they know who you are, you got a right to go into school. There's, there's, you know, we should have a right to access. They want to lock us all out. They don't like us. They're questioning. And I think it, um, it creates a breeding ground for purple haired English teachers teaching crazy stuff. And that's personally going on in my life. It's not made up. Absolutely. We're hearing it from every quarter. Uh, what's going on. Parents are finding out, um, through the grapevine, uh, what's happening, what their kids are actually being exposed to. And they're finding out by accident. So, um, you know, transparency is is just a great tool to yeah. rebuild that trust. I think parents really want to trust their public schools. They really do. It's just been, it, it, it's it's been torn down so much, that trust, because of what they've, what's been revealed uh, that's happening in their school and the reaction to it that uh, that's really causing a great divide right now. We do have a great opportunity. Uh, we we have a parent's bill of rights that means absolutely nothing because it has no teeth. Uh, we spent a lot of time last session passing uh, bill after bill to fill out what that means in terms of parents being able to see what's in their school libraries, yeah. parents having access to what their child actually checked out. Um, some of these bills were watered down because Republicans forced that. Um, my bill on that uh, Senator, uh, rep former Representative uh, Sims mentioned, Senate Bill 1211, would have allowed uh, parents to see everything. Um, would have required that, that uh, all the curriculum and the supplemental things that are being taught would have to be posted seven days after it was taught. And if it was if it included anything of a sexual nature, uh, it would have to be posted three days ahead. So parents would have a heads up and be able to give informed consent. We're, we're, we're all worked up about this sexual thing, and I get it, but it's worse. The Marxist part's worse. Yes. Because they're not going to convert that many kids into being trans. They're going right. to get some some marginal, some fringe uh, human experience people who will be swayed by that with kooky parents who go along with it. But they but, but they put even that in every uh, type of classroom instruction, even math. Yeah. So so it it's I not enough it. to just ban sex ed before fifth grade anymore. It's 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 permeated. Like math is only in there's only math and math. Right. No, it, it, it it's crazy. And uh, you know, I mean, really, what's going on here is uh, Arizona's here. The answer is this. The public schools aren't going to be fixed. The unions aren't going to be broken. Our legislators don't have the chutzpah to do it. They won't get anything done. Nothing's going to happen. They're going to pass useless laws with no teeth, no accountability. Nothing will happen. This is what I hear. And and you know what? I don't disagree terribly because the win is charter schools, the money going away with the kids, the mobility of the money going to the private sector, getting away from these stupid public institutions, which are ruining our kids. And that was a big win this term. Huge win. Mm -hmm. Huge win. So it ends up not being about school. It ends up being about money goes with the kids. Right. <laughs> and everything else. We we can't pass a law that you can't teach lesbian sex at the kindergartners. We couldn't pass that law in this state probably. But we but we can get the money connected. It's all about empowering the parents and the families to make <laughs> these decisions for themselves. And if you don't like the product that's being delivered yeah. because it's too woke or lesbians and te being taught in <laughs> whatever you just yeah. said. Um, you can go elsewhere and find the fit and for all our watchers, for your child. I really am supportive of lesbians. <laughs> I'm just, it was an example of the madness that's going on in this country. <laughs> um, I want to talk for a minute about the Republican Party because I feel like the Democrats are really honest. They're very honest. They're wrong. They're in denial. They're honest. We want to make gas $10 a gallon so you'll buy electric cars. 
because we value the planet more than the pain of the individual people. We don't think you should have a choice. You're not educated as much as we are. You should live our way. The way we tell you. And we're going to put you on a digital currency so that we can shut you down when you don't buy right. They're very honest about it. I wish they were honest about their own hypocrisy. Of course. But they're super <laughs> honest about their agenda. The Republicans are liars. Um, half the Republican Party, in my opinion, are Democrats. And you're being... You're hearing it called being called the Uniparty, and then you're the America First candidates, right? And 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 it's easy to say, oh, it's this binary thing between the Trumpists and the non-Trumpists. It's more nuanced than that, I think. We have these very go-along, get-along, doocy types who are still acting like it's the 1960s, and that there isn't some radical agenda to 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 stop. And there's enough of them that if you don't have a supermajority. You can't get anything done as a Republican because they'll get, they're going to vote with Democrats. You know, in Washington, we got we got Republicans voting for gun legislation. What the hell's going on? We've had a team on the field for a very long time with no captain in the state of Arizona, in my opinion. I mean, I think that's the biggest challenge of the Republican Party. Um, and that's why you have all this fractious conversation. Uh, we have a we have a platform. There's nothing wrong with if you want to be in the Republican Party, agreeing. You know, you you should look at the platform and it, and it, either you agree with it or you don't. Well, how does it yeah. work? Does someone gets to just say I'm a Republican and they can be like whatever they want? Is that how? I mean, how does this? Don't doesn't someone have to go? Yes, you can put R next to your name. You register to vote that's, as a Republican or a Democrat. That, that's what the or citizens independent. decide. They, you know, and that's that's where citizens are coming off the sidelines and actually looking at what your voting record is and how you're voting on on different things during the session. You're seeing the request to speak uh, impact how people are considering legislation, but it only has, like you said, a limited uh, impact because you can't change a person's stripes. They, uh, I really believe that. Most, most people are who they say they are when they are running, and they don't change once they get there. Um, and we do have a fractious party, many of whom don't really believe our platform to the nth. I think, personally, it has a lot to do with money. <laughs> um, you know, they always say, follow the dollar, follow, yeah. uh, follow the money. Yeah. And I just think there's way too much collusion conflict of interest between big business and government because you know we we've crossed that line where uh we've we've violated our own republican principles saying that you know we believe in self-sufficiency that the citizen is responsible for them themselves and the government should have a limited role <laughs> we've compromised to the point where we basically are a uniparty on those issues now we've done some great tax policy to improve our revenues mm -hmm. thank god if we elect a democrat now well, that's gonna be mowed down mowed right. down right. biden's gonna do it for us we're gonna have to fight that back um but yeah we we have a we have a big problem in our party i, I can't disagree and that, and I think following the money will help us solve those issues. It's on healthcare. It's on, especially healthcare. It's so the, obvious. The other, I'm sorry. The other thing that's going to help us solve this issue is that people are free to leave the party, and they are. We have a significant number of independents in our district because they've been frustrated by maybe the politics of the political party. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to say. Uh, and uh, so I, I understand that. I understand they want to feel like they have the freedom to pick whoever they want based on their message and their, their agenda. There's something um, going on, you know, there's some sort of battle going on and we've just seen like, okay, we've got national players meddling in our local election and we've got national money meddling in our local election. Um, it seems like Jim Lehman was pulling crowds, seemed like he had the momentum, he had done the work, he was having big rallies, lots of people, talking to lots of folks. And I've had both he and Blake in here and spoke to, to both of them in depth. Um, Blake seemed really nice. I thought he was too young for the job. They don't trust his techie background. But 
um, better than any Democrat alternative. And he gets the anointing by Trump. It seems like it upends the momentum of somebody who had spent the money and done the work here. And and he may not be the candidate who can beat Mark Kelly. So we have national money. Trump is basically meddled with his endorsement. And honestly, I don't know how he could pick him over Jim Lehman. And and now the federal, now Mitch McConnell and the National Republican Party saying, we're going to pull $6 million of backing for this guy. So now because of that, he's lost $6 million does a lot in a, in a Senate race. He lost $6 million bucks this last week. Because there's a pissing contest going on between Mitch McConnell, who'd rather be the president of the losers th- than be in the winning party That's under someone problem. else's charge. <laughs> That's a problem. Am I missing something? Nope. Am I, think I that pretty much sums it up. It does. I think yeah. there's a standoff going on in terms of the funding for Blake Masters right now, in terms of what Mitch McConnell's going to do and Peter Thiel. And, and, and it's, and, you know, and it's kind of symptomatic of what's going on at the microcosm here in, in the state with with the traditional country club Republican set versus the America first Republican set. There's this, yeah, that's the fight that's going on, yeah, right? We're well, absolutely you Republicans right. for, uh, for Mark Kelly. So, I mean, yeah. That's... So, uh, in my last race when the Democrats won, <laughs> what? <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But my, yeah. yeah the, bananas. uh, the Democrat won in my last race. It didn't win any of the precincts, but won because, uh, he was able to pull on the coattails of the other Democrat who was an incumbent. Uh, and you just see this, this, uh, oh, I don't know. How do you put it? They, uh, they say the country club Republicans, he was very upfront, honest, as you said about it. Uh, he said, well, we have a lot of country club Republicans in our district who think that the Republican party is too extreme. Now they're, they're Republicans. Yeah. Uh, but he called them, like you said, the country club Republicans. And I think it's important for us to educate the voters and tell them that the alternative to the Republicans is radical and extreme. And don't buy the 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 hype from these outside organizations that are coming in and flooding the, the election with money to try to paint, portray us as the extreme party. We are not the extreme party. Right. We, if you ask us any of our positions, most people would say, if they had the time to focus on it, they would say, oh, you want to empower parents in our schools? Great. Oh, you want to fill the backlog of police? Terrific. I want safe communities. E- e- even Lower America, taxes, even, even the, better. Even the America First kind of radical Republican, it's actually not radical in my opinion. Like, and I, I you think I'm pretty centrist. Yeah. I, I speak a little radically, but the idea of funding police and parental rights and school and teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic, that's now radical. Right, that, right. That's what they're labeling the Trumpists wing of the party as. Correct. And, you know, the, the country club Republicans, I guess, for lack of a better term, if you want to use that, uh, yeah, they don't like the Trump demeanor, the Trump messaging the way he speaks um and uh i mean i understand that yeah they 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 cringe a little when he you know but uh uh, i don't think you can argue with the policies that were working i mean we (laughs) i'm just four years ago from now when i was last in this to see how everything has unraveled we were on such a great path we had great prosperity for everyone an opportunity and that's that's well and people are going to be uh, i think they're going to be uh, kind of swayed uh, w- with with Biden's latest action with uh, taking uh, taking Iran in, under his wing with this uh, with this treaty, um, and there's going to be some some gas flooding into America, and the gas prices are going to go down, and they'll give Biden the the praise and think, well, things aren't so bad after all. Good thing we're in business it's with good, Iran. Yes, absolutely. You know, we've got to, we really have to be aware of what is going on and connect those dots. <laughs> we have a, a, a radical guy in the White House who wants socialism. He is a socialist. And you know, it, it, I don't even know, Nancy, respectfully, I'm not even sure he knows what he wants. No. Well, it's right. the people around him well, that want yeah. it. <laughs> on his best day, he was kind of stupid, and he's a shadow of that, okay? But he clearly has in his staff a bunch of beltway marxists in in his politburo that are running him um you know i think one of the things 
we have to find a way to do, and you talked about when we, when we pre-spoke this morning, just about, you know, what you guys wanted to chat about. When you talk about educating voters, I think there are two groups to talk to. The first group is your swayable five to 7% in the middle. It's your Reagan Democrat. It's your kind of swing voter, neutral kind of centrist person who can kind of go either way. They're not a soldier. And then you've got your country club Republicans and they've made it. And they're driving around their Mercedes and they're driving around. They got the really cool European sports car for the weekend. They got their nice house up in Troon. What happens to every community that this affluence parachutes into? I grew up in Scottsdale when it was a horsey. It was a horsey town. And now it's a richy rich town. And that's okay. I've moved along with it. The problem is when the poor shoddy BMW crowd comes in, somehow or another the people who have benefited the most from capitalism are the most Marxist liberals in their voting. We've Lim- got a, limousine liberals. Mm-hmm. It's in we've you know how are our self-identified country club Republicans that fill up Troon voting for Mark Kelly? How is that happening? Because we have to make we have to continue to make the case even within our own party. Yeah. Okay, so um, the big thing is the border security, uh, transparency and education, um, advocacy for. Uh, some of the most downtrodden uh, accountability accountability mm-hmm. for our public health care mm-hmm. as you see it supporting our police S- funding the police refunding yeah. the police refunding the police yeah I have to do it um what else what other big items um it, 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 and then at the end I'm gonna I'm gonna throw my own two cents into it well you know I think God God has to be a big part of what we talk about to everyone. Um, I don't think we can avoid talking about uh, renewal and actual reform in our country, in our state, even in our cities, um, without touching on that because and giving people hope. Because frankly, um, I think it's pretty clear that even if we elected every wonderful pro-freedom person at every level of government, we would still fail. It's too far gone without his hand, without his mercy, without faith and hope. We've lost that in America. We've lost that. We have to get back to it. And we need to shamelessly say that and give people the freedom uh, the permission, if you will, to go there because people know it's true. God bless America. Amen. Well, uh, my two cents as uh, you, as the two of you head off to the Arizona legislature is I think we have a bunch of corruption here locally. And if you can, you know, stick a finger in the dike of some of that madness, that's what you get to do. Okay. And I think that's the same in every state in the country. It's worse in some than others, you know. Louisiana, Illinois, New York, California, they have levels of corruption that make us look like, you know, child's play. We're pikers. But anything that you guys see out there, you know, I talk to, you talk to a lot of people, I talk to a lot of people who call in, text me constantly, my number's out there, three million people a month, look at our you know, social media, and I get a lot of feedback. Anything we can do to shove it to the central authority, which is Washington, anything we can do to tell them no, and and no matter what it is, no, no, not interested, nope, can't do it. I think one of the baller-ass moves that could be done in this state that would set a precedent that would change half the country would be to get together with Kerry Lake and the Arizona National Guard, and ramrod two of our big mining projects that have been held up for almost 20 years, waiting for EPA and the federal government to say it's okay. We should just break ground and do them and say, sue us, send in the federal troops. We're doing this. And it's heavy metal, it's nickel, cadmium. It's things that we use and need globally that we only buy from China. And 
and Arizona's got all of that right here. I think we should break the rules and get sued. Say, okay, sue us. We're putting the mine in. And and then sell it on the market. And I think it would change America. Force the federal government, instead of us having to put the finger in their dike, force them to put the finger in all of our dikes Mm -hmm. out here. Everybody putting up the resistance. I think the resistance is sometimes it's just doing it and say, Mm -hmm. stop me. Mm -hmm. And and then we got a governor, you know, if we get Carrie Lake in, I think we're going to have a governor who would do that. Yeah. So... If if it, sometimes it's just having the courage to do it, not getting permission, it's uh, getting forgiven after the fact. You know what I mean? So I, I I think that would be a baller baller ass move for y'all to do, and it would create jobs for thousands and thousands of Arizonans in the sixty to seventy thousand dollar year range, which moves the needle for a lot of American families. I think it would be spectacular. Let's yeah. talk more after we get elected. Amen. All right. All yeah. right. I look forward to working with Carrie. Um, we got to get her elected. We got to get her elected do. for sure because the other one is a complete nutter. Um, <laughs> let's talk just for a minute. If you want to support Nancy Barto, Nancy, where do they go to? Um, and, and so, folks, I hate to say this, but the grease that turns the political wheel is money. And there's a lot of money coming into this state from George Soros for our um, attorney general candidates. There's a lot of money coming in the state from the National Democratic Party. They're meddling beyond beyond imagine. And the money that's coming in from California to battle our conservative candidates, it's happening in your state too. They think this is a purple state. It's not. Can I add something to that? The old district um, had so much money poured in by the National Education Association, George Soros. Cinema's team, when she was running knocked on Republicans' doors. There were friends of ours that would call us and say, not only did they knock once, they knocked twice. And she won the district over Martha McSally, a traditional Republican district. And that's that's the game plan for Mark Kelly. And we need the resources in LD4, which is Paradise Valley, Phoenix, and Scottsdale, to combat that. They see LD4 as like the crown jewel of Maricopa County. It's where all the business people are. Yeah. Um, all the money is and yeah. and they want that district for themselves and that it was that effort that got cinema in and all the democrats uh four years ago and we need to push back against that and we do you're right we need resources to do it so if you want to dive in and help nancy uh and if you're up in marin county and your money doesn't matter as much up there or you're in brookline massachusetts and your money doesn't matter at all or if you're in the beltway and your money doesn't matter there either and you want to Toss a little in to help out the conservative pro-America movement. Nancy, what's your website? Well, thank you. Uh, My website is nancybarto.com. It's very simple. N-A-N-C-Y-B-A-R-T-O.com. You can go there. I'm sure you have a little button for contribute. I do. I do. And uh, it is imperative. Our district is in uh, the crosshairs. It's probably uh, the most competitive one. Um, despite our our slight Republican Democrat uh, registration, uh, that can be a little deceptive in this area. Yeah. And I am up against a uh, an, a, a union, a teacher backed uh, teacher herself, yeah. um, who is they do not want to lose her. Uh, she's an incumbent as well, because we were both drawn into the same district. So I'm an incumbent in another district, running in a new district with another incumbent Democrat who has served for four years, so is well known in parts that I'm not well known in, I've got to get my message out to reveal Christine Marsh's radical voting record. And that's our plan. We've got a plan uh, that we're going to implement. We're going to be releasing it soon, but we need to fully fund that plan. So I would appreciate any help, uh, large or small, at nancybarto.com. NancyBarto.com. Boy, when I was a kid, you know, we had done... Do you remember getting under desks? Like, if there's a nuclear explosion, here's what we're all going to do, kids. We're going to get under the desk. Do you remember doing oh, that when you were a kid? Yep. I remember that. And I was thinking, of course, you know, I'm under that whisper to one of them, but it's like, you think this will work against mm-hmm. a nuclear bomb? If the building comes down, do you think this desk is going to help? But we used to say better dead than red. And I went in the Marine Corps, and it was the same way. We were, we were ready. We were training to fight communists. And we were training to fight Russians. 
My specialty was cold weather airfield seizure. It was planning on going into Northern Europe and seizing airports. It was planning on going into Russia. So the idea that I'm battling openly avowed, publicly disclosed Marxists in my own state, in my own country, calling themselves Democrats, it just, my level of hostility and desire to take action is spooky. Maria, <laughs> what's your website? Sims4AZ.com. S-Y-M-S. S-Y-M-S. F-O-R-A-Z.com. S-Y-M-S. F-O-R-A-Z.com. So get on there, donate a little bit of money, help out the America First conservative movement that's here. And right now we've got our finger in the dike and hopefully we get enough people in there that are just radical enough to say no. Because what we have is a lot of group think that just doesn't say anything and it lets the crazy leftists have their way. And half of crazy is still crazy. We've got, it's radical now to see if someone was going to burn down your house and you saw them outside with gasoline and matches trying to light your garage on fire, you wouldn't go out and negotiate burning down just the garage. You'd go start screaming at them, right? Call the police. You'd make a ruckus. Get one of the neighbors. Get the hose out. Start squirting them. That's not radical. That's makes sense. That's reasonable. And that's what the America First Canada is really all about. We've got our hose out and we're screaming and we're ringing the bell. There's anti-American lunatics burning down the country. I don't think it could be overstated. And I and I don't think it's radical. If you ask a radical conservative what what's radical about them, a, a liberal can't tell you anything that's radical about them. They just label them as radical. And, and then when you ask them, why do you think you're radical? Well, because I don't want them teaching this stuff to my kids uh, because I, you know, I go to church on Sundays. Uh, I really want America to be able to have all of these things in case of an emergency. We shouldn't be buying all of our antibiotics from India and China. I think we should make them here. You're a radical. I think we have to tear down the myth of radicalism because it, when you say someone's radical, it's easy to marginalize them. Well, ladies, thanks for coming in. Um, I know it's risky. You're like, who is this guy? What are we going to talk about? He's a lunatic. Oh, you made it fun. Come on. All right. It was fun. Um, I, it was great having you guys in. Thanks for being here. I wish you all the very best. And um, uh, I know I, I, I've actually I've actually put up signs for both of you. Oh, thank you. I, awesome. I, thank you. I did that we at, have more. I did that <laughs> at voting locations the night before the election. Oh, uh, I went out you, with Vera and we did that. Oh. So um, I, I wish you both the best of luck. And uh, anybody who wants to get involved, sometimes, you know, people say, oh, I already gave enough this cycle. Take a Saturday and go put some signs out. Everything you can do to help um, uh, empowers these campaigns. Uh, it's a big deal. Anyways, thanks for being here. Thank All you. right, sports fans, that's the Thank show. You. Thanks for stopping by. And uh, we'll see you again next time. I'm out. <laughs>